Hello, welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode 13. With myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Hey. Coming at you from a place called Lockdown. Um, on today's show, we're going to be discussing a little bit of industry stuff. Sam's going to give us a lowdown. Then we actually um, managed to interview, well, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Michael and Fauci this week. And um, yeah, we, we're going to play that to you guys. And then after that, we sat and watched The Master. Uh, both Sam and Jackson have actually seen it previously, but I hadn't. So we sat and watched The Master the other evening. And uh, we've got a nice little review and discussion around that. So without further ado, over to you, Sam, for a little bit of industry. So there's a new film coming out with uh, Tom Hardy about Al Capone. Its original title was called Fonzo. And like it's been in development for a while, and it's from Josh Trank, who's the director who did Fantastic Four, or is that, is that what they call it, the comic book film? Fantastic Four? Yeah. yeah, Fantastic Four. And everyone knows Fantastic Four is a terrible film, and the director had loads of infights with Marvel, and he basically had he couldn't make a film for a long time. He um, the film he did before that was Chronicle, which was a good film. If you remember, do you remember Chronicle, no. the superhero movie, no. it was found footage style. Oh yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah, the guy showed that he had some talent, and Marvel ate him up and spat him out. And he was going to do a Disney film, but he got sacked from it because it was the same producers. Well, now he's back with Capone. Which, you know, could potentially be good, but the fact that it's being ditched onto VOD next month doesn't suggest it's a very good film. It had some buzz, and now that buzz seems to be quieted down, but hopefully it's good. But anyway, yes, it's coming out across the world next month. I think this is something we're going to get used to. We're going to see more films where it's like, it's coming out next week. It's coming out in two weeks, rather than seeing more of a, this is coming out in five months' time. There's the ambition with certain cinematic releases, of course, but we're going to see more and more of these indie films just being thrown out on VOD. But it means we're more likely to try and review them, which is good. Costs it means they're less. a lot more accessible to the public in general. It does, and, and that's the hope, that it, it will generate that, or it's just going to be like, oh, they've gone straight to VOD, that's probably not any good. Yeah, we'll you see. don't want the, the straight to VOD being the new straight to video, do you really? Like... Exactly, and that's what there's the potential of happening here. And that's why when I found out... <clears throat> when I found out this film was coming out like this way, it was kind of like, this feels a bit like that, you know? Mm. Straight to video gangster film. But in essence as well, it, it could be a bit more of a marketing move to try and gain as much revenue back in off the back of it as possible. Because if they can't have a cinema release, they wouldn't be able to have a cinema release if it was in a month. Yeah, that's the thing. It's that, it is that potential and it might have just gone straight to VOD anyway. It might be doing like a limited cinema and then a VOD at the same time. No one knows. It might have had a festival plan in place. It might just mean an easier sell for the film. Could be a great film. We'll find out next month. <laughs> there was a slew of uh, horror remakes announced. And like, the truth is, these films have already been announced as remakes. It's just directors being attached. And how the media have been playing it is like, oh my God, look at all these horror remakes that are coming out. How bad is that? When the truth is, they have just been having creative talent attached to it. So the three horror remakes that are announced this week is we have Night of the Hunter, which is based on the 1959 film, um, Hellraiser, which had a director announced to it, an acclaimed director who did The Ritual, and Salem's Lot. So with all these horror remakes uh, coming up, there's been a bit of a backlash pretty much instantly. And a lot of like film websites that I sort of appreciate have been going, oh, another horror remake, another horror remake. And they're all being announced the same week. It's like, well, it's not. It's just the, the directors got announced around the same time. Plus, they're good directors. And as we've discussed before, there is, no, there is nothing wrong with remaking. So that potentially, there's three interesting new interpretations of some horror films coming out. But uh, no I one ever reads an article like that. I think that that's sort of part of the, um, the toxic fandom that exists. Because like, even in like, old horror films, you... you you get that sort of toxic level of fandom where people are like, it's got to be this way or it's not at all. Um, and yeah, I think that that's, that's part of the reason that they get this kind of backlash from everyone um, immediately. Well, usually that is the case, but with these horror remakes in particular, from the articles I was reading, mm -hmm. it was more that they saw it as like the third wave of remakes of films that weren't very good in the first place. And I feel that's, like an, that's an unfair assessment. Apart from Night of the Hunter, which is seen as classic, Hellraiser is, it is a good film. 
And Salem's Lot has had many different interpretations that are mostly TV related, so it's actually the first film interpretation of it. But that's also mad to me because most remakes, when they're remaking a, a, an original film that wasn't that great, um, you, you, you usually make something better out of it because they've sort of rethought about it and, and you know... Um, New perspective. Exactly, mm. yeah. Roger Corman, who's one of the, the great B-movie producers of all time, who also discovered you know, some of the greatest directors like Scorsese, Coppola, uh, De Palma, he has set an isolation challenge. The guy's either in his late 80s or early 90s and he's setting you a film challenge. <laughs> Essentially, he's, the challenge is to produce a two-minute film and you've got to use being in your house and use natural lighting. And I think it's kind of cool that they're setting these sort of challenges. He first set the challenge towards filmmakers he's either helped in the past or new up-and-coming indie sort of genre filmmakers and seeing how to work with them. So, like, it'd be interesting to see how people get in the mix. And you win, like, a certificate signed by Roger Corman. And as he said, he hopes it's to be the one and only quarantine film festival. And you're seeing this a lot. There are so many quarantine film festivals. The majority of them are completely free entry as well. So it's well worth checking out. Thanks, Sam. That was industry. Um, so like I said, uh, Sam actually had the pleasure of sitting down and uh, having an interview with Michael Falsti. Um, just to give you guys a bit of background on this, uh, Michael Falsti is a filmmaker on the independent filmmaking scene and uh, recently had a film called Exit premiere at Horror on Sea, which we obviously had the pleasure of going and see. So over to you, Sam, for your interview. I'm here with Michael Fausti for uh, Trash Arts Take. How you doing, man? You good? Yeah, I'm well. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. So it's very sunny, very bright. Dealing with the lockdown okay? Yeah, yeah. We're just trying to keep um, creatively busy within the limitations of our home. Yes, yes. I think there's going to be a lot of movies made about uh, lots of people sitting inside doing not very much after this. <laughs> yeah, let's hope some of them are of quality. Indeed. <laughs> So, um, so, so how did you get into uh, filmmaking? Um, I've always been a, a big fan of, sort of both cinema, but uh, British cinema in particular, and sort of growing up during the 70s and 80s, BBC Two seemed to forever be showing sort of movies by people like sort of Michael Powell and um, you know people of that sort of like ilk. And I really got sort of switched on to cinema by looking at sort of things like Black Narcissus and The Red Shoes and all of these sort of on the surface movies that seemed almost like fairy tale esque but there was a real sort of darkness behind them um, and then I guess we'll fast forward to the 1980s and there was um, a TV show that used to run on BBC Two on Sunday evenings called Movie Drone which was presented by the director Alex Cox and it was really here that I got sort of switched on to a lot of cult movies, which I, I just never heard of, you know, sort of movies like Performance, Get Carter, um, Alphaville, and a lot of sort of spaghetti westerns and film noir that really this, this was a real eye-opener to me because at the time in the sort of like mid to late 80s, the only sort of stuff that was showing in cinemas was sort of dumbass blockbusters and the only British films that were getting made were these sort of horrendous period dramas Mm. Um, in which everyone was sort of speaking with these cut glass accents. So to actually see that there were other kinds of sort of films out there and available made me sort of think, you know, this really was something of an inspiration. I thought these these are the kind of films that I want to start making. You know, I want to make these kind of films that you know, walk dark paths and go in unexpected directions. I mean, I didn't really have any idea how I was going to go about it, but... That's really, I think, that show, Movie Drum, is what really inspired me to go out and pick up a camera and start making stuff. It kind of sounds like, um, cause I, I don't know much about that, um, that BBC Two programme, but it sounds a bit like how cinema had their like midnight cinema. Where, yes, yeah. And yeah, it, it completely did change a lot of creatives' minds. Mm. To think that there was a bit of a bigger, you know, darker world out there to be able to explore. Yeah, no, definitely, and, and often they did show double bills, and you're right, it was, they, you know, it was things like The Wicker Man and a lot of sort of B-movie stuff that would have played at drive-ins and that, that really just wasn't getting any exposure, you know, you, you didn't sort of go and rent this stuff from the video store or, you know, see it on your local synagogues, it just wasn't there until ITV certainly wasn't showing this kind of thing. So it's almost like the starting point of um, when cult audience started to build, if that makes sense? Yes. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, there's a 
filmmaker, he's, he's incredibly knowledgeable even to this day. You know, he, he really does know his movies. And and as I say, you know, all thanks to Alex Cox for sort of you know getting me started really because it's as you say these sort of cult movies make you sort of think, well, no, this is a bit more interesting than straightforward narratives that deal with you know sort of very black and white heroes and villains and and sort of you know very convenient trite endings or dare we say it people are always looking over their shoulder to make a sequel these movies never really had that kind of sort of motivation behind them mm, they were just more just art pieces in their own regards so uh, tell, yeah, no, definitely. tell us about your um <clears throat> tell us about the first film that you've made It was probably with, sort of in the nineties. I um, I was a student. And I was sort of desperate to make a film, and even video cameras at this point were horrendously expensive, and nobody was going to let me have a go on one of their video cameras. And so, almost sort of by chance, one day I, I was walking past a charity shop, and there was a Super 8 camera in there, and I didn't really know how to use it. But the first movies I started making were these sort of slightly pretentious, arty Derek Jarman. Super 8 films, um, most of which didn't have titles and I sort of didn't really edit much. And I think I sort of, you know, continued doing these sort of artsy things. And I did a few things on Hi8, but really, I guess I actually sort of sat down and thought, right, I'm going to do a straightforward narrative piece, which I, I guess I wrote back in about 2010 and then finally got around to filming it in about 2014. And it was called ZAF. And I shot it on a um, just a high street video camera, and you know I think I probably learned more by shooting that short film than all of the other sort of films I'd watched and books I'd read. And it really was a case of you know you you didn't know what you what you don't know until you start making a film, and you're literally just coming up against problems all the time. And and it was a continuous struggle to sort of solve those problems. But yeah, my first film was called. ZAF, or what I kind of regard as a proper first film, and it it took me over a year to edit it, and you know I continually revisited it and kind of did various things with it. But yeah, it, it came out in about 2014, and and I was actually sort of pleasantly surprised at sort of how well it did as a as a sort of first effort, and it then made me realise that you know there there is still the possibility of having nothing and being able to kind of make a film and and get it out there to festivals, you know, and. It, you know, it really did sort of spur me on. Well, this is it. After this, you had um, a succession of other short films, which you have done really well with festival runs. Like, I, I've, oh, always, you, I've always noticed them popping up and stuff. And <clears throat> and sometimes I wonder if it's because you, you do have, like... Because um, the, 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 the next couple of short films you had, you weren't, like, bombarding yourself with lots of short films, which I know I do. Yeah. But yeah. It, that can play much better... Better... Better with having that time of getting everything precise and, of course, getting some recognition from festivals. Um, the first of those sort of short films, to me at least, because I, I, I remember you had, there was a postcard for it in the hotel lobby at Horror on Sea. Yes, on the yes, at Horror on Sea, the ingress date. Yes, yeah, Check yeah. Free postcard. <laughs> yeah, tell us a bit about more about that film. Um, the ingress, I mean, again, I've always loved Super 8, even though it's... Um, it's a bit fiddly and you kind of send it off and it can come back and there's nothing discernible there but after kind of uh, I mean as I'm sure you know Sam so one of the things you're continually struggling against as a, as a filmmaker is, is locations and actors and yeah. particularly if you're sort of like a no budget filmmaker it, it's you know you, you're always on the clock and people let you down and I actually sort of thought to myself could I make a film that didn't really require location and actors and I was playing around with my sort of Super 8 camera and I just literally thought could I almost like video or uh, film rather sort of scenes and have them be sort of suggestive that these were sort of murder sites at the same time I was playing with this idea I sort of came across some source material about a guy who a British guy who seems to have been involved in a number of murders and I kind of sort of put the two together and ended up with this sort of piece known as the Ingress Tapes, which is a seven minute short shot on Super 8, in which a guy kind of muses about past crimes. And, you know, he's, he's one of those kind of characters who I've sort of seen to often end up sort of writing in the, 
you know, I, I don't really like sort of being judgmental about characters, even if these are, you know, quite extreme in, in their outlook. So this guy essentially narrates the um, crimes that he's, that he's carried out, and he's completely unrepentant about them. And, you know, and I think in many respects, there are people like this walking around. Yeah. You know, my sort of mum and dad grew up during the 60s in South London, and knew a lot of these sort of like famous and not so famous kind of sort of characters who went on to become infamous. And yeah, you know, a lot of these people served their time, came out of jail and just became old men who sat at home and watched TV. And, and you know, these people you know, did some pretty terrible things and now they are sort of retired and sitting at home. And I always remember sort of growing up and listening to a lot of these stories, but it's always sort of stuck with me, you know, what did these people do next? And I think The Ingress Tapes was was a film about, you know, a guy looking back on his life who had done some pretty horrendous things. It's kind of interesting because your next film, uh, Dead Celebrities, although I haven't seen it, just by the thematically how you just described the previous film, they sound like they kind of like connect well. Yes. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the kind of sort of, genesis behind dead celebrities was after making the ingress tapes it was then a case of you know you're continually sort of thinking as a you know no budget filmmaker i need a location to make a movie and literally i'm sort of in my house one day and i sort of thought well look everybody's got a bathroom i know enough people they've got houses why don't i come up with an idea to actually film in bathrooms so I started doing some research into famous murders that took place in bathrooms, and I realised that a high proportion of celebrities have actually died in bathrooms, and really that was only the, the kernel of the idea for dead celebrities, and it's narrated by a guy who in many respects is, is fairly similar to the narrator of the Ingress tapes in that he's, he's kind of deluded, living in the past and kind of can't really face reality outside of the little bubble that he lives in. And uh, he's a big fan of uh, conspiracy theories and celebrities and believes that he should be famous simply because he wants to be famous. And um, and that really is Dead Celebrities. I mean, in some respects, I, I actually really enjoyed shooting Dead Celebrities because I was able to take my time with it. And we you know, filmed it in, I can't remember how many bathrooms we used in the end, but about seven or eight bathrooms kind of acting out these famous celebrity deaths, which was, it was good fun on one level, but on the other sort of sitting in baths, getting freezing cold and trying to pretend to be Jim Morrison and lie very still, uh, wasn't always fun. But yeah, I must say I, I, I did enjoy sort of editing dead celebrities as well. And it was, it was quite good fun to make. Do you have any of these short films on any, like, because I know that they're, 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 they're relatively old. Are they on any non-exclusive sites or your own YouTube channel if people want to check them out? No, not as yet. I mean, we've got the trailers on our YouTube channel, uh, which is Faustin Films. And uh, we are kind of contemplating putting together a sort of um, a short film compilation of all, all the work that we've done so far uh, with a view to possibly sort of self-distribution with it. But we haven't kind of sort of like got anywhere yet really to kind of put them all out. I think I'd like to put them all out together rather than sort of piecemeal. Um, but if people want to make their way to our Vimeo channel or our kind of YouTube channel, there is other various bits and bobs up there that people can take a look at that we've sort of shot over the years. But no, our last couple of um, shorts I really need to get around to sort of doing something with, perhaps putting a collection together. Now that would be a good way to do it because like, like you said, they've been... Because there's not been hundreds of them and stuff, it would be quite a nice little compilation. And the thematic yeah, connections. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's only really, I think, when people like yourself start, you know, asking you about your work, you realise that there are connections across the films, which I, I don't really see. I just sort of come up with an idea and I sort of start work on it. But as I say, it's only when sort of people start sort of looking at your stuff and sort of saying, oh, I've noticed this, you realise that, yeah, there are actually connections that, that go through the work. So it, I guess it would be nice to put a collection together so that, you know, people can see for themselves. Yeah, definitely, man. And uh, <clears throat> this has all led to your first feature film with Exit. Um, yes. Which, again, I have to apologise. I, I really wanted to watch it. It was one of the films I definitely <laughs> wanted to see. And we literally arrived, I think, about half an hour or so, like an hour to a half an hour before the screening. And we just oh, wanted to drink. Excuses. Bad excuses. excuses. 
I need to at well, some point I, I, ask I for a screener. Out, sir. There's a man. There's a man who knows, and uh, I'm sure I'll be able to get a copy to you. <laughs> awesome! I really do want to see because I saw there was such a. I remember talking to um, Daryl Buxton afterwards, and I think because it was Exit, yeah. and then it was Day of the Stranger, and that's right. Yeah. He was just in awe, like the reviews he's been writing and stuff. And I was just like, this is my kind of film. I need to watch this film. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, no, um, Daryl, I mean, you know, very kind about his, his, his kind of sort of perceptions about it. And to actually get that kind of sort of positive feedback from a sort of writer and journalist who you really respect. And, and as I say, who, who, who knows his stuff, he knows his cinema and... And yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't be happier with how sort of our first feature exit went down at Horror on Sea. And, and you know, people are actually sort of very um, complimentary about it because it's it's not a straightforward narrative. And I think a lot of, um, you know, we were just talking about the Ingress tapes and the Ingress tapes, I think, is one of those films that people either really like or they don't. And I think the same is true of Exit, that you're either really going to connect with Exit or, or you're just, you know, it's it's really not going to work for you. And I think that in some respects, I think I'd rather that than, you know, people fell asleep in it. No, that's the thing. And um, everyone, the description was always, and I remember even like Daryl said that it felt like a lazy description, but the perfect description was that the film was very Lynchian. Yeah, it's very kind. Um, I mean, obviously, like everybody else who grew up in the 80s, you know, it was, you, you couldn't fail to be impressed by sort of David Lynch and, and what he was kind of producing. And, you know, I mean, I guess it, it's a comparison that has been sort of say made by Daryl and a number of other people, but I didn't intentionally sort of set out to, to make it Lynchian. There was just a kind of sort of surreal quality when we were filming that just really seemed to lend itself to this, to this strangeness. And I think, what always appealed to me to watching David Lynch was this this idea of a dream world, and a lot has been written about the similarity between film and dreaming and stuff like that. And my real sort of big influence, you know, sort of growing up was a lot of surrealist cinema, you know, sort of Louis Bunuel yeah. and Myra Deren and sort of people like that. And I think I've always tried to, you know, look at the world from a, a surrealist perspective, and I think that. Particularly, I think, where you've got these... I mean, Exit is a movie that takes place in a single location in which two couples are sort of forced to spend the evening together. And murder, drugs and sex all then ensue. And, of course, this this is sort of meal to the grist in terms of sort of like, you know, your, your subconscious and dreams and motivations and stuff like that. And I think that it really... You know, how else could you deal with a subject like this with you know, without you know, being surrealist, I think it would be impossible, really, and I, I don't know, it's, it's just, that's, that's how I kind of sort of see the world and sort of see films as a, as always a kind of sort of surrealist experience, you know, I, realism is not something I particularly strive for in cinema, I, I much prefer it to have a, a, a dream-like quality to it. No, I totally agree, and I was, when I was, um, when I first got into films proper, I was into surrealism, like La Jador and... Yeah. And Shinandalu and all that kind of stuff, and yeah, and it is always interesting, especially within like um, because horror, like cause Lynch does do horror films, but he plays yes. around with what horror is and, and still keeps it like I don't know, very much character focused in, in a certain direction where it's not going to give you the horror expectations. And yes, I mean, you know, it's sort of Del Toro is an interesting one because on one level, you kind of sort of think, is it fantasy, is it horror? Is it art house? And I think that, you know, a number of people have said this about Exit. They sort of said, well, is it really a horror film? And and I think that really, you know, surrealist films are by their nature sort of difficult to to describe. Yeah. But I think, you know, probably the, the best cinema is not that that is constricted by, by genre, you know, that does kind of sort of like, you know, go across different genres and, and you know, things of that nature. No, definitely. Now, with Exit's obviously on its uh, festival run, so I'm, I mean, I don't know if you are considering, but is there anything your your next project? Have you got any thoughts yet of where you're going next? Um, yeah, I mean, I, was, I think like you know, all the filmmakers in the country, if not the world at the moment, I'm sort of sitting here, you know, working on various um, projects. I got a couple of ideas for features, which I'm sort of playing around with to sort of see if they've got legs and and will work. But um, I, yeah 
no spoilers yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair enough. And is there like a, a dream project, something that you would like, if you had the budget or the access to whatever you wanted, what would be the story you would really want to tell? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, yeah, like, all, like all filmmakers, we're continually sort of you know, moaning about the fact we don't have enough money and we don't have enough time. Um, but I think in some respects, it, it's that lack of money and time that can often, you know, really sort of force you to think on your feet. And, it, and it's what keeps indie cinema interesting. Mm. But I guess if, you know, if, if somebody was going to write me a blank check and they could sort of smooth things over, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, great British talent out there I'd sort of really like to sort of work with. Um, I got a bit of a soft spot for sort of old school London villains or people like Ray Winston and yeah. Alan Ford and. You know, a lot of those old school sort of English actors like Nicky Henson and Malcolm McDowell would be great to sort of work with them. Um, also, there's a, a actor called Barry Keen who I really like, and it would be a real dream to sort of work with him. He's done things like American Animals, 71, uh, Killing of the Sacred Deer. He's got a very sort of strong look about him. I like actors to have sort of quite a sort of strong sort of physical presence about them. Also, I mean, you know, again, it, I mean, I guess a dream project would be one in which you, you ultimately could pick your your cast and, you, you know, there would be no sort of restrictions on that. Also, there's an actor called Susan Lynch, I also really like, um, you know, she's done a lot of sort of things over the years. Um, and Caroline Monroe as well, it'd be great to actually work with Caroline Monroe. I was helping out Tom Lee Rutter, who I, I know you know. Yes. Um, couple of months ago and he was filming with Caroline and I was just a sort of a innocent bystander during the process but you know just amazing really just an amazing actor and just such presence um you know just the kind of just almost just on cue you know the camera goes on and there's just a kind of magic that really sort of happens and yeah so it would be great to uh, to work with Caroline Monroe um, and as I say, yeah, a dream project would just be one in which you could, you know, somebody gave you a blank check and you just picked, pick the talent that you wanted. Um, I mean, we've always, you know, with Exit, we were really fortunate to get some great actors on board, and we actually got to um, got to cast Tony Dem in one of our roles. He's been in like The Football Factory and Name of the Father, and it was yeah, real sort of joy working with sort of somebody who you've grown up with watching. Mm -hmm. and I, I think that's probably the same for a lot of directors that you never really stop being a, a film fan and a bit of a fanboy. And when you see these actors, it's kind of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you sort of grew up watching their movies and, you know, you just, just want to really sort of work with them. No, definitely, man. Definitely. Well, thank you very much for talking with us. No pleasure. And uh, I hope you have a good day. And you, sir. Speak Take to you care. soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. So, the other day, we um, actually sat down and uh, we watched The Master. Like I said before, both Sam and Jack had actually seen it before. And this is my first time watching it. Um, and obviously, it's directed by uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, who also did There Will Be Blood. Um, which I wasn't aware of before we actually sat down and watched it. But I went in with a little bit of a, well, <clears throat> a blind view. I didn't do any kind of research into the whole story of it. Um, and whenever we sat and watched it, it was really interesting because I had a completely different perspective to Sam and Jack who've seen it a few times. So I, my whole view on it was initially that, so I didn't know about the whole Scientology aspect to it. It was obviously there, but I don't know enough about it to kind of understand it. And I could realize that there was a bit of a cult kind of situation going on. But in any kind of film that you watch, you follow characters and you're on that journey with characters. And even though there's sort of subversions outside of the, the characters that you're following, that interact with the characters, basically turn around and saying, what you're doing is wrong, don't really like it. The way that like Philip Seymour Hoffman, for example, interacts with them outsiders and that he puts them down, I, I thought that was quite strong and I was very on board with it, like the way that he presented himself. I also viewed it, the master, so Philip Seymour Hoffman, um, he kind of tried to deconstruct Joaquin Phoenix's character almost in a way to try and rebuild him because of all the post-traumatic stress and the way that he couldn't really interact in social environments. 
but actually it's very manipulative, which then Sam and yeah. Jack told me about. So my perspective on it was completely different. You fell hook, line, sinker for the cult. Yeah, but like even, <laughs> to, yeah, but also whenever we spoke about it um, last night, <clears throat> one of the things that kind of came out massively for me is that when you watch a film, you're invested in the characters, you follow them characters, and even if people within the story, even if they're like the smallest character, turn around and go, oh, that's wrong. You kind of, you do side with the characters that you're following because that's a stereotypical way that film is designed. You mm. Even if you think with the Joker, even though the Joker does wrong things, you're following him and he kind of becomes hero, like becomes the hero of the story. It was very much like that. So from my, maybe a slightly blinker, I'm kind of viewing it in that sense. So my perspective was ultimately altered to sort of side with them characters. Well, that's the thing I think, especially with this film, you've got your main characters and you're, you're, you're emotionally invested in them and watching them, but then you've got all of these other elements that are going on, um, uh, not sometimes in, in the foreground of the, of the shot, but you don't notice it because you're looking at what Freddy's doing, uh, you know, if, uh, and you can see people trying to communicate with past lives and stuff like that and really sort of like odd little details that only on like you know a couple of times of watching do you really um digest that information and understand that information of, of what it's uh, communicating to you because you know you are we are used to when we watch films following a, a, a character and, and focusing in on that and his journey never really shows you that aspect of the cult. He, he doesn't ever seem to be particularly spiritually driven, this character. So he's only there for the psychological help that they're, that they're kind of offering him. Um, partly because, you know, the Scientology is, has that built into the, the, the process of, of bringing people in and sort of uh, brainwashing them into the, into the um, religion. Um, but... It's, uh, yeah, in, in terms of that, it, that's why I think that it doesn't always come out immediately to someone on a first watch of, like, uh, of noticing what's actually going on. But I think also on that, you, like you said, you're viewing it from Fer Freddy's perspective. Mm -hmm. There's like a scene that happens whenever he joins them and stuff. They're in this house, they've been invited and what have you. And he just sees all the women within the house because he's like, he, he's fascinated with sex, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's driven by that. Um, very like base impulses. Very yeah, primitive. Yeah yeah, 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 very animalistic, and they touch on that quite a lot within it. Um, but he views all the women being naked, and they're dancing around and having a laugh and singing, and and that's what kind of then started to blur it for me. Because yes, you've got the Scientology thing going on, but then you're viewing it from Freddie's perspective, and the way that Freddie's viewing it is like you say, he's there for the help, not for the spiritual sort of cultism stuff. Mm. And so then it, also, it does become very mixed. Yeah. You're like, what is going on? I think there's also obviously that sense of like belonging that he's getting from being part of this. I mean, obviously he at the beginning of the film you see him as a as a naval navy man and and so going back to being on a boat um, with this group of people that act as if they are family or comrades, you know, it'd be quite easy for him to fit back into um, that sort of institutionalized pattern. Um, so I think, he, because the thing is, is he's never really a very intelligent character, he's not really thinking things through, so I don't think he's, like, consciously there for the, for the help, if you know what I mean, he's just not interested in the other aspects of, of what's going on, and you notice that the most when he um, puts those headphones on and he's listening to um, the master uh, preaching about... Um, uh, man being above animal and, and you know we cannot give in to our animal urges because we are we are more than the animals we are better than the animals and and um, that's the moment where he passes that note across to the woman that says do you want to fuck yeah. and that, that that sort of counterbalance of seeing him listening to this and not being aware of his own impulses being that base and animalistic um, is, is just really fascinating to me. I, I, I love the way that they've played with that constantly of um, him almost breaking uh, breaking his leash every time that it starts to sort of... Until tighten they it. tighten it to the point that it's it's impossible to, to break and then finally he leaves and that's, yeah, that's yeah. enough. That's the thing. He's very much uh, impulse-driven. And I think one of the reasons, like, from your response that you had where you felt 
taking in with the story and not thinking too much about occultism. And it does take a few watches to really pay attention because he's so front and forward a charismatic man. You've got Philip Seymour Hoffman giving an outstanding performance of a man who can't see any wrong in what he believes in. And he's convinced these people. And you're right, there is that scene where the guy basically says, you know, <clears throat> you're running a cult, this is all ridiculous, and he snaps. And the first time I watched that, I was always with Philip Seymour Hoffman being like, he's just defending, he's just defending. Yeah. But then when you realise how aggressively he snaps... You're like, no, this is just, he's breaking because someone's out of his bubble has just reminded everyone inside the circle that maybe this is all bullshit. And there's that whole dialogue with his uh, son who says the same thing of, you know, he's making it up as it goes along sort of thing. There's always that notion, as soon as the second book comes out, you can see the following almost starting to drop in that respect. Because in the first notion with the first book of their faith, it's all about going back to past lives. Whereas in the second book, they bring in the idea of imagination. So it's stepping away from the care and hypnosis and like, you know, psychology essentially. And it's a really nice parallel with, with Scientology. That the more money you invest and the more you invest in Scientology, that's when you find out about the aliens. And that's when you watch Battlefield Earth and you find all the truths. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's some, yeah, there's some mad stuff about Scientology. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, religious group. I, but that's why I like with this film, they didn't necessarily... They knew, obviously, for lawsuit reasons, they couldn't tell the direct story. Mm. So instead, they created their own religion, which is so very closely linked to it, but then put all the focus on Freddy's character, mm. of the person who goes to that, the lost soul, who goes to those sort of religions. Yeah. It makes for a more interesting story. And I think they really, they really uh, explore the the way in which he's he's become psychologically damaged enough to to get to this point as well, where they, uh, you know, obviously during his interviews he breaks down about how he'd uh, slept with his auntie, and uh, you know how he three uh, times yeah and and stuff like that. Uh, but then you've also got the um, post traumatic stress disorder from war. Um, you've also got the fact that he just never socially fits in with anyone mm. in, in, in any kind of capacity. Um, but he, he really wants to. He wants to be part of a group and part of a team. And that, that sort of explains his military history as well. Um, so it's just such a well-rounded character that you can... You feel like there's a real person in there. And they're not someone that's massively complex or, or you know... Uh, a genius or, or have any kind like he's he's pretty he's pretty stupid but like his character is so well developed mm. that you can yeah you've got so much to it i think um with the master personally i know it's only been out what eight years came yeah. out in 2012 it feels like it will be seen as a cinematic classic maybe not people's favorite films because it is a, it's not a straightforward story and there are loads of layers where you have to sort of watch it a few times to get into to the, you know to see those character depths and stuff but the thing is there are some scenes where like that particular scene you were just discussing about the whole where he has to keep repeating about sleeping with his auntie and he starts slapping himself and he's not allowed to blink the way that scene is composed and edited it's just it's just like it's so well structured and the fact that you stay on that one shot where it's like, don't blink, and it just stays on his face completely. It's just such a perfect scene of tension. So <clears throat> what Jack was saying, um, so for the first time I was watching it, I'm looking at everything that's more or less at the forefront. So you kind of go along with the story and you take it at face value as to what you're given. So you see Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, he's very much like the master, the guider, you know, he's the head honcho of this group. And it almost kind of is like their own little family, which I know is very cult-like. Um, but basically what you said was that there's so many different layers within it that on first viewing, I probably didn't pick up on loads of certain stuff. Well, I think what's interesting about that is that um, when, you're, when you're looking at the way in which they manipulate him, the way in which they um, psychologically break him down, it never seems like they're doing it for a nefarious purpose. They always seem to have his best interest at heart. Um, even though uh, if you read into it, if you sort of understand 
what it's basing itself on, you know that it's to essentially control him and to keep him as well. There, are, uh, what I what I interpret to be their attack dog essentially, because he, he proves throughout it that he's willing to be violent um, uh, in in defending. Um, Lancaster. So, it, right, we touched on this last night when we were speaking about it, and I thought about it afterwards. I said to Sam, it's like, <clears throat> I, I agree with you in the sense that, like, he wants him to sort of be there to, or well, the master wants Freddy to be there to kind of cover for him. But then at the same time, he disciplines him for being that rash attack dog. So, what, again, whenever I was, I was trying to think what was my perspective on that when I watched it initially, it was very much. Again, they're trying to help him. They're trying to bring him in and get rid of them attack dog elements. You think about whenever he goes to that person's house and he, he attacks the bloke who questions um, Philip Seymour Hoffman within the house. Um, and then he's like, no boy, that's a bad boy. It's like he's disciplining him for being that attack dog. Ooh, yeah. And they're trying to deconstruct it. So I think that that, that to me plays, still plays very similar to what it is now. He's still trying to conform him and bring him in, and it's like he is his puppet, um, but not for the attack dog reasons. Absolutely, but I think that you know the speech in the in the wedding that um, that Lancaster Dodd gives, uh, where he's talking about uh, the dragon, the dragon yeah, putting yeah. the dragon on a leash, and uh, you know being able to say "sit, dragon," and the dragon sit, and uh, the, the, I mean it's a wonderful like it's a wonderful speech that really sort of paints a picture. Um, and he's he's you know purportedly talking about marriage at the time, um, but really you feel like he's talking about how he views the world around him, and that if you can uh, take that raw power, that raw uh, rage, uh, and you can control it, well then anything is possible for you because, because I agree. you control it. Then I agree. I, I think in from his s or from his point of view, what he wants to do is take. Um, the dragon, Freddy, and tame it. Because whenever the, there's that whole incident where the police turn up and Freddy kicks off and then he ends up in a cell and he goes ballistic and then it almost seems like he's... <clears throat> Philip Seymour Hoffman's done with him. It's like, oh, I'm your only friend. It's manipulation again. I'm the only one that cares about you. No one else cares about you. Only me, only me. Um, and then whenever he's back at home, he's getting quizzed by the rest of his family saying, like, oh, we don't think it's going to work with Freddie. We need to get rid of him. He's risky. And it's almost as if Philip Seymour Hoffman can't let go of his own pride at that point. That The dragon hasn't been tamed yet. He hasn't put the leash on it. So he pretty much goes, oh, well, thanks for your concern, but I'm going to bring him back anyway. Brings him back, does more manipulation. But this time I think it gets a little bit more intense And to what you were talking about with um, the whole eye colour. Yeah, the moment where, where he's sat down with the, um, it's the uh, Lancaster's daughter, isn't it? No, it's, no, it's his wife. wife. Oh, it's his wife. Amy okay. Adams. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and, uh, and she's saying to him, uh, now look into my eyes, tell me what colour my eyes are. And then, and then as she goes through the process, she, she uh, says to him, now make my colour eyes blue, now make my eyes black. And each time afterwards she asks him, uh, what colour are my eyes? And he answers the colour that she's told him, but it's only after that moment that she's that he's uh, said what colour the eyes are, that the colours change. And yeah. Then, and, and that to me is is this, it, it's uh, that sort of manifested um, uh, visual experience of, of them manipulating him, of them being able to tell him uh, black is white and, and the sky is green, and, and him just go, yes it is. And that's what they're trying to trying to delve into him, in, in my interpretation of it, anyway. So it's also um, the, the the back and forth in the living room, mm. and he basically gets him to do it for so long and describe the wall and then describe the window. And he keeps doing it, and then they all like go off and have their lunch and out in the pantry and what have you. Um, and then they come back in, and then finally Philip Seymour Hoffman tells him to stop, and then embraces him. So initially, I thought. That was them trying to deconstruct him down to be a bit more patient so they could build him back up again. But you guys turned around and said it was more that, oh, put him to his breaking point and then, oh, I'll be the saviour from Philip Seymour Hoffman's point of view. Which is, again, completely two different perspectives of looking at it. But the interesting thing as well is it, it, it does depend on how you choose to um, interpret the words of Lancaster. Because when we go back to that speech, uh, and I think that speech is such an important moment in the film, um, when they, 
uh, when we first really see um, Lancaster, you know, talking in a public uh, space, and uh, I mean the, the 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 interpretation that Freddie has made of that speech is that his rage, his own inter internal issues, are the dragon that he wants to tame, that he wants to put on a leash. Um, so there's always that throughout it. It feels like there's that duality of you can see what Lancaster's saying as being, if you interpret it from Freddie's perspective, or with that sort of uh, focus and uh, lens in mind. Um, yeah, it, it, it always seems to be positive, and, and he seems to be a genuine friend to him. But as soon as you think about it from the other perspective of what is he trying to say, knowing that he is the intelligent man, he's the one with... Uh, quite a, a illustrious education from what he says in uh, I think he says that he's a particle physicist and, uh, and scientist and this and that so he's a, clearly a, a quite well educated um, quite well educated man and so to him what he's saying is it seems more thought out it seems more um, purposeful and deliberate and uh, I, yeah, it's just it's just fascinating watching those two those two characters and and how they uh, interact. And of course, by the end, um, Freddie's character has uh, has rejected um, Lancaster Dodd and, and rejected the master and turned away from him. Um, and I, I think that this is partly because they actually did a good, uh, to a certain extent, a good job of rebuilding his. Mm. Um, psychology and they, they actually ended up helping him inadvertently and losing the control over him because he was able at that last moment to sit there very calmly hear these very aggressive things said to him and say no I'm gonna walk away and that's quite that that's a massive change mm. from the beginning of the film where anyone criticized him and he was just straight up and going for it I think after that as well he almost gets that like uh, Blacking Phoenix Freddy almost gets his own solitude um, and his own form of hope, so his like animalistic urges for sex, and and he gets that in the end. So it's almost like it's a glimmer of hope in this kind of crumbling world around him. I think um, <clears throat> one thing I was just thinking about when you when you were just talking about that was um, Paul Thomas Anderson. He seems to have a trait where he creates characters who are essentially father figures who aren't actually fathers. So there'll be blood, you've got D.W., or is it W., whatever the little kid's name is. It's not his son, is it? It's um, the son from one of the people who's working in the oil holes. And I'm pretty sure in Magnolia there's a similar story situation. And it seems to be something like, of a, re um, like a motive, and, it, and you do see it in the master as well. Because it, they've taken away that sort of fatherly element, and more like we've discussed in length about as a pet. Almost, you know, or the other analogy you could see is like the mad scientist and its creation. And that's why he's created this character, this perfect thing that explains that everything that he's written in these books is real and true. Because Freddy proves that. And he just can't get that. He does not succeed in that. Um, yeah, it's interesting that Paul Thomas Anderson always goes back to that sort of story of that not a real father, but they always want to put themselves in the position of the father as well. You never necessarily see it as um, someone searching for a father, if that makes sense. Because Freddie doesn't come across someone searching for a father figure. He's just... He just searching. wants to belong. Yeah. Mm. I think as well with, with uh, Joaquin Phoenix's performance, I mean, the physicality to what he does throughout it, the violence in it is so... Um, raw and animalistic it's it's not you know it's not like punches it's not like kicks it's it's just grabbing and grappling with each other throwing each other to the ground and that moment when um he's if he, you feel like um, uh, i can't it's towards the end of the film it's the guy that he drags out uh, well he After calmly asks book, him to come yeah. out and then he gets him in a headlock and then he throws him to the ground and then he ends up just slapping him for ages <laughs> and it's so awkward uh, the fight scene but that makes it so much more real and so much more um, authentic yeah and impactful it makes you really feel the the rage that that character's feeling at the time but not only when he's uh, uh, 
hurting other people or, or, you know, being violent to other people, when he's doing it to himself as well, the way that he just smashes his head and he would just find a way to hit himself on something, and particularly the moment where he's just been arrested um, and he's in, the, he's in the cell and he's just... He, whacking his head against mm. that bunk and the, the whole thing is moving up and down and then he just starts kicking the toilet smashes that to pieces the the pure rage in it and none of it feels cool or, or glamorized in any way it just feels awkward and messy and yeah like he's in a really really it's like an animal in a cage yeah and he's trying to break free I think like the general craft of the whole film, it's it's a film that's it's A grade filmmaking, you know. Mm. It's a stunning film. The score from um Thomas Greenwood is is just hypnotic. It's it's a beautiful bit of music. And yeah, all the performances all across are great. Amy Adams is great. Even though I always feel like she feels too young, when you think of who the master is, of course you can have a bit of a younger wife, you know. He's probably been able to pro she she was probably one of the first people he programmed, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and she's kind of interesting, actually, because uh, there's quite quite a few scenes where she's sat behind him in in some capacity, mm. and she's making, she's giving orders, she's giving making demands, she's being very, she's a very powerful figure within yeah. it, but she's just often hidden off to the side in in a in some ways. She's not the showman that um, Lancaster Dodd is. Mm. Um, but I think she does have a little bit of string pulling. Oh yeah, definitely. It's almost it Macbeth. Feels, yeah, it yeah. feels a bit Lady Macbeth kind of thing. That's that's what it felt like to me. So, um, guys, as a summary, and out of ten, what would you give the master, Sam? See, I I feel like every score I'm giving is like extremely high, but I really love the master. I love Paul Thomas Anderson's work. It's not There'll Be Blood to me. That's his personal best, but I would still give it. Because it grows on me every time, so I'd still give it a 9.5. Hi. Jack? I would say that the, the filmmaking in itself is absolutely immaculate. It's, it's, it's an incredible piece of film. Um, the characters are so well developed. The, uh, the acting is incredible. Cinematography incredible. Music incredible. Um, the only thing to me that I would say makes it not something that I could easily watch over and over again is that the narrative wanders a bit, um, which I love, but it doesn't make it the easiest watch at yeah. times. No, I, I agree. I, I, agree. I, would, I would still I'd give it a 9 out of 10, but it only misses out on that point because it's not something that I want to sit down and watch day after day. <laughs> I felt pretty bleak by the end of it. I was just like, oh, and then you guys told me it was a, like uh, a cult and uh, yeah, Scientology. I was like, oh, uh, even worse. <laughs> um, no, I think for me personally, like a bit like you, Jack, a bit like you, Sam, as well, the acting and stuff is brilliant. Um, Joaquin Phoenix's performance is absolutely cracking. I think he should have probably got an Oscar for it. Yeah. Um, but where it does lose its narrative, like, I... I watch films quite intently anyway, or intensely. Um, with this, even though I was following the narrative, I got lost at points. Um, in particular, like when they start riding that motorbike out in the desert, just kind of felt like, oh, let's just stick that in there too. So I'd probably, like you, Jack, I'd give it an eight though. I'd give it an eight out of 10, simply because the narrative kind of lost track a little bit. So thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, as always, stay safe. Please keep indoors. Um, be healthy. Be kind to each other. And, uh, yeah, please give us a like. Leave a little comment. And, uh, or as ever, subscribe. Other than that, Trash Arts take out. Ta-da.